Um, so if I can ask our uh, esteemed panelists to join us, and certainly if you have questions for Dr. Shinazi, please include them to the panel. I also want to welcome my co-chair, Peter Palacy, who will uh, moderate this session uh, with me. Uh, you recognize all the individuals from Mount Sinai on this podium, but I think it's still worth uh, illustrating or underscoring that they're not just great leaders, uh, but they're also great scientists, innovators, and entrepreneurs. So Peter and I will take the liberty of reminding you of some of their accomplishments. Uh, Dean Charney, of course, is the Aaron Krantz Dean of the school but he's also made fundamental contributions to the understanding of, cause, uh, of the causes of human anxiety, fear, and depression, and the discovery of new treatments for mood and anxiety disorder. His research on depression has led to discovery of new and novel therapies for treatment-resistant depression, including ketamine and the first digital treatment for depression. He's been honored with all the major awards in his field for his scientific research, including world's most influ influential scientific minds in 2014 and 15. He's ranked 48 out of 1,360 of the most highly cited life science researchers in the, in the world. Uh, his discovery for ketamine for treatment-resistant depression was named by Cleveland Clinic on its top 10 list of 2017 healthcare innovations. He holds multiple patents and foreign patents. He's published over 785 articles, uh, many books, book chapters, and his most notable and recent book was uh, entitled Resilience, the Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges. Uh, as well as others, and he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2000, the National Academy of Inventors in 2017. So uh, he is a master innovator, as is our CEO and President Ken Davis. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, his uh, pioneering leadership of the medical school has really uh, underscored the importance of population health management, but as a neurobiologist, he also conducted pioneering research that led the FDA to approve four of the first five drugs for treatment of Alzheimer's. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. He's a co-author of almost 600 articles and recognized as one of the most highly cited researchers in the field of brain diseases. He's won numerous awards, including, including the George H.W. Bush Lifetime of Leadership Award from his alma mater, Yale University, and was named a trustee of the Aspen Institute in 2014. Uh, and then third is Dr. Valentin Fuster, who uh, most of us know as the physician-in-chief, as director and director of the Mount Sinai Heart Center. Uh, his qualifications are exceptional as a leader and an innovator on population health and cardiology. He's been named uh, honor Dr. Honoris Causa by 33 uh, universities. He's authored more than 1,000 scientific articles with an H index of 145. He's been uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and his own research into the origin of cardiovascular events has contributed to the improvement in heart attack uh, treatment. Uh, he is also, in 2011, awarded the Grand Prize Scientifique of the Institute of France, considered the most prestigious award in cardiology for his translational research into atherothrombotic disease. And it's also noteworthy that Dr. Fuster is the only cardiologist to have received the highest awards for research from the three leading cardiovascular organizations, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the European Society of Cardiology. And then in May 2014, King Juan Carlos uh, I of Spain granted Dr. Fuster with the title of Marquis for his outstanding, un unceasing research efforts and his educational outreach work. Peter? The <clears throat> fourth um, panel member from Mount Sinai is Yasmin Hurt. She is a professor of psychiatry and the director of the Center for Addictive Behavior. She got her PhD at Karolinska University in Sweden, and then went to the NIH and became a staff fellow. Then she went back to Sweden for 13 years, only to really come back to Mount Sinai, to the United States. She is a very good colleague, a very good citizen. She was, uh, for example, the MD-PhD program director, and she has an extraordinary successful research program. So what is it? What is her research? She is really interested in the neurobiology of drug abuse with the emphasis on opioids. She is also uh, very much interested in the 
neurodevelopmental effects of cannabis. And I just wanted to mention one thing which really sort of uh, fascinates me and the younger ones among the audience may sort of listen. She does experiments in animals where she can show a cross-generational effect of cannabis. So in other words, you have a mouse, pregnant mouse, give the mouse cannabis, and then not only the first generation, but the second generation, and the first and the second never saw cannabis again, has cognitive problems. So this is something to really think about. So look up what she says. <laughs> Dr. Hurd is also very much interested in sort of helping developing new medicines, and one of the uh, cannabis compounds is cannabidiol, and she found that it actually inhibits the craving. So this may be a potential medication for opioid addiction. One of the, so there are always two sides, so one of the compounds may actually be really helpful in drug addiction. And last but not least, I would like to mention this, she's a National Academy of Medicine member. And one more person uh, should be mentioned here and on the panel, but we also will have his keynote uh, speech later, and that's Tom Maniades. He got his PhD at Vanderbilt, was a postdoc with Mark Ptashny at Harvard, and with Fred Singer at Cambridge, UK. He had faculty positions at Harvard, at Cold Spring Harbor, at Caltech, and at Columbia. And now he is actually a, the CEO of the New York Genome Center. So he's someone who is pretty active and moves around. He is most known, I would say, for the broader audience in science for having written the Bible of uh, gene cloning. Uh, it was molecular cloning. Uh, a laboratory manual. It was in every laboratory, and uh, this really uh, made him famous beyond his uh, science. He is a co-founder, and this is important for our translational aspect here. He was a co-founder of Genetics Institute. That was one of the three successful biotech companies on the east side, Genentech, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Genetics Institute, Biogen, and Genzyme and Genetics Institute brought several drugs to market, uh, Factor Eight, Factor Nine, erythropoietin. He's a founder of Acceleron Pharma, which is, uh, was uh, quite successful. It's more uh, than $2 billion market value now. <coughs> He's a co-founder of Proscript Pharma. He's a co-founder of Calliope, and this is a new company which sort of is interested in connections between the brain and the gut. Okay. Um, he got many awards. Uh, let me just <coughs> mention the Eli Lilly Award from the American Society of Microbiology. In 2012, he uh, was awarded the Alaska Prize, and he is a National Academy of Science member, a National Academy of Medicine member, and a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, maybe we'll start, uh, if I can ask the panel in whatever order you choose, in, in your experience as an innovator, which is abs the absolutely essential or which are the absolutely essential ingredients to move an idea from conception to clinical usage? Dr. Charney, what do we, what do we need to get over the finish line? Well, um you know, as was mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the talk we just heard, uh, you gotta be prepared to fail. Uh, so I have failed a lot, uh, and that's okay, as, as was mentioned. Uh, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. So you need the uh, confidence uh, to move beyond your failures uh, to keep pushing. Uh, secondly, uh, What's been important to me, and I think it's, it's been important, I think, to all the members on the panel, is to try to answer the big questions, you know, you know and, and pursue them in a, uh, a careful and structured way. And also, um, I would say, be prepared uh, for unexpected findings, uh, because uh, 
you know, many times the, the important discovery comes from unexpected uh, directions. So in my case, when we discovered that ketamine is an effective treatment for treatment-resistant depression, uh, we were not predicting it. Uh, but when we gave ketamine to patients with depression, they, uh, they started telling us within a few hours that they were better, which was um, un nobody believed it, the finding uh, for years, uh, but we, and we decided to uh, uh, pursue it. Uh, but we were smart enough to notice that something was going on here that was unexpected, and so be prepared. Yeah, all right. Um, I'll just pick up from what Dennis said. Um, you have to be prepared for the unexpected. When I was giving cholinergic drugs, um, I started giving cholinergic drugs to bipolar patients. They were manic patients, and I was doing it in order to change their mania, to move them to a more euthymic or even dysphoric state. And one of the patients turns to me and he says, Doc, this is great stuff. My brain feels clearer and sharper than it ever did before. And I thought, could that be real? So I began to look in the literature, and in fact, there was some animal rat data that suggested that these drugs could make rats smarter. Um, and that led to a study in young Stanford students, and we had the most incredible finding that had never been reported before, and that was that we could improve human memory. Um, it never even been Stanford done. Even Stanford students. Even as Stanford <laughs> students. These were smart kids who needed money for a study. Um, so we had to be prepared for the unexpected. Um, other things that people have said before, but I just want to emphasize, great collaborators are important. Um, developing drugs that team sport, uh, and if I hadn't been surrounded by, by great people who also believed in the cause, psychologists, chemists, um, biochemists, it would, it would have never happened. So, so that, that was terribly important. And um, we were young at that time, and uh, we were lucky that we had a mentor who um, believed in giving us freedom. Uh, didn't think that anything was impossible, just like the Heinlein quote that you had. Uh, when, when I remembered entering his lab, uh, we had made a contract, and the contract was, he said, you do my studies, and I'll let you do whatever you want. So I could do my studies, and he never interfered. He was just a great person who was the godfather of psychopharmacology. That was Leo Hollister. So those were the factors that made us successful. Dr. Fuster, anything you want to add? <clears throat> well, I, I can only say that in general terms, I think it's critical uh, resilience uh, and sustainability. One of the great problems today is we, we easily fall apart and we decide to quit. And this is completely against what we are talking about here today. And then the sense of a team effort is essential, the sense of uh, integrating people into programs. Today, uh, a good program is the one that has people at the basic investigational level, at the intermediate level, at the clinical level, and then you can really move from one end to the other. And I think if I go back uh, 15, 20, 25 years, we all tend to move in the investigational field in a rather individual basis in always asking for advice. Today, I don't think you can apply to NIH unless you have a good program project, and then you have people that really dominate all the specialties. But most important is the team effort, the trust to each other, the friendship, and, as I said, the sustainability. So for me, I, I mean, I, I follow up with all the things that the gentlemen have said, and I, for the work that we did, there's, it's important to like looking at your work and being able to be open that you may be looking at the opposite side of another reality. So we studied what we thought was cannabis for a long time, but we were studying THC for the most part, and we would see these negative effects in regard to addiction vulnerability, cross-generational effects that were negative on cognition, and you know, other people showed very strong effects with uh, psychosis. But we had to go counter to our thinking because we started studying other cannabinoids and actually saw the opposite results. And I think sometimes when you are, you're, you're really trying to force your hypothesis, letting 
other than letting your results speak for itself. So we had to follow the fact that we were seeing something that was different, that this, this cannabinoid was actually improving anxiety, improving psychosis, and that's what then led us down the track of, let's see if, whether or not this can be translated from the um, animal, from the basic bench to clinical studies. So I think that that's one thing I think that's really important for um, how do you move your science? It's not being married to your results, not being married to your hypothesis. It's really critical to be very open-minded. So with me, it's, um, I think it's important as a scientist, as a young person, first to build your foundation, and that is to publish, to get grants. And once you've done that, I think you can't just sit around and let the world go by you Doing nothing has consequences, as I said. And it's important if you have a good idea to eventually talk to colleagues, mentors, get your patent, get your data, make sure it's correct, file your patents, and start talking about forming a company or licensing your technology to a company. I think that's, that's the first step. It sounds like insurmountable barriers, but I think there's a lot of experience in New York and other places. And but if you believe you have to be you have to be the ambassador for your technology, for your innovation. Nobody else is gonna do it for you. A lot of people are gonna tell you it's not gonna work. Or they're gonna find reason why it's not gonna work. Or they'll find you a paper to tell you why it's not going to work. But if you have your own data and you believe in your data, then pursue the goal. I think you'll be successful. So I, um, I think that the most important ingredient is uh, understanding uh, deep biology and disease mechanisms. I mean, that's, I think, where we all start from. Uh, you can't really think uh, creatively or uh, deeply about how to cure or treat a d disease if you don't really understand deeply uh, the underlying biology. Uh, you have to really... Uh, match the technology with the biology, which is a challenge. There, you know, especially these days, the the uh, technology is advancing uh, so fast. But um, I would say the most important thing uh, are the people. That uh, it's been my experience uh, in the companies that I've uh, started and uh, in uh, the lab over my career is that it's really good people, really smart people, and are dedicated uh, to doing exciting things. And uh, I would say uh, any success that I've had is really due uh, very much to being able to uh, surround myself from uh, extraordinary people. Thank you very much. We will invite the audience, but let me ask first a specific question to Dr. Hurd. What problems and opportunities, medical and commercial, are created by increasing availability of recreational cannabinoids. Dr. Hurd. <laughs> Dr. Palacy loves marijuana. I uh... <laughs> <laughs> never tried it. <laughs> <laughs> so the funny thing is, so I was born in Jamaica, and uh, when I came to New York um, as a teenager, everybody thought that all Jamaicans smoke marijuana, and so when I went into addiction as my field, especially my friends were like, but you never try anything. Well, how can you, you know, study this? Um, so the, the, we now have this crazy federal government and state government regulation of um, cannabinoids and medical marijuana, where on one hand, there's legalization for recreational use and for medical use of marijuana. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, and there's also this race for who's gonna make the most money from it, also from a, a recreational medical perspective. So when you look at recreational use, many people think now that since it's legal in many places, it's safe, that it does not have any long-term impact, and obviously our research and others show that even low doses of marijuana can have long-term impact, especially in the developing brain, and especially in relation to psychiatric vulnerability. But like every other drug, um, there are good and bad uh, effects of, of marijuana in terms of, like I said, we have some positive effects we see with certain cannabinoids like cannabidiol. 
And those are what's being pushed in the medical market and of other aspects of THC for pain and other cannabinoids. So now they expect on a commercialization level for medical marijuana that it's going to hit over $25 billion in the next f four to five years. So we are working on, for, an in for innovation, um, formulations and delivery mechanisms, delivery systems that will be more medicinal. We don't believe in smoking. Um, that's not medicine. And there, as I said, specific cannabinoids that are very interesting. So that's where we're working with different companies to improve on the formulations and the bioavailability that can be used medicinally. But recreationally, um, as I said, um, there's still, it's not this, it's definitely safer than opioids, but there, it still has consequences that I think that everybody should know, even for Advil, there are negative side effects. So it's the yin and yang of this rush to uh, this, uh, call it this cannabinoid gold rush, and everybody thinks they're gonna make money on it, but it's really important that we still protect our, our citizens. Maybe I'll ask a question to Dr. Davis and switch gears a little, or Dr. Charney. Um, You've both been instrumental in redefining how healthcare should be delivered. Is that an entrepreneurial activity, and does it follow the same path and instincts of creativity in that setting as it does for drug development? Uh, where is the creativity in addressing population health, value-based care? Well, it certainly requires the same level of creativity and the same excellent collaborators. Um, but it's different from the entrepreneurial nature where there is you know, at least for the nonprofits like we're in, the upside isn't measured in the margin, it isn't measured in your profit. You know, it's measured in the quality, it's measured um, in your ability to sustain your business, and it's measured in your ability to reach out to underserved populations that otherwise can't afford healthcare. So in a world in which um, the payers, federal, state, employers, insurance companies, and patients all can't afford health care. Our challenge is to be able to make it affordable and to sustain the level of innovation and excellence and quality that we have. And in these times, that's very difficult, but it requires the same kind of teamwork, expertise, high quality people that you need for drug development. Yeah, and, but, but it goes hand in glove. What Ken said goes hand in glove with the kind of science we're talking about today. So when you discover a new treatment for hepatitis C and you help many millions of people, you know, that reduces healthcare costs. Uh, you come up with a, you know, a new treatment uh, for depression, which is uh, you know, one of the most costly diseases. You help your healthcare system. So we need to do the kind of research that is the basis of a lot of what we do in the medical school, which maps on uh, to what our health system is doing more generally uh, to provide access to care and improve the nature of that care. You got to do both. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Skinazi, you took us on a tour de force starting with HIV, uh, HCV, and uh, HBV, uh, hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus. So what do you think is, are the most pressing antivirals for the future? Well, I, even though it seems to be self-serving for you, I think influenza is a huge, oh, good. Is a huge problem. Did you know the um, answer? Um, I mean, the vaccines are great, but they don't always work. And we saw what happened last year with a success rate in the 40%, maybe less, in certain parts of the world. So we haven't done a very good job. We've been waiting and waiting for a universal vaccine. I mean, I've been waiting and I'm frustrated because I'm hoping, I was hoping there would be such a thing by now. So I said, okay, well, it's maybe time for us to get involved with influenza. And in fact, we are going to start, uh, we've been working on influenza for the last three years. Uh, although I didn't want to touch influenza because I thought Dr. Palazzi would already <laughs> have solved the problem by now. Uh, but uh, clearly it, they haven't. So hopefully one day they will. But it is a very interesting problem because even if you have a cure for influenza, 
it's not like HCV. You can, every year, you'll have to be cured again and again and again because you'll have different strains if you have a drug that is. So I think vaccine is, it would be fantastic, but we haven't been successful. I think everybody thinks the same thing about HIV. It would be great to have a, a vaccine, but we haven't had it. And a lot of people would have died if we didn't have that. So I think uh, clearly influenza is one of them. I, I would say RSV and other respiratory viruses, is, is respiratory syndrome virus for kids and adults is a huge problem. The drugs we have right now are useless, particularly useless in my opinion. And uh, I think also to go out on a limb a little bit, um, uh, other than the things I've talked about, um, norovirus, I like norovirus as, a, as something that should be developed, although well, it doesn't always kill people, causes tremendous diarrhea and immunocompromised patients. It could be a problem. It's a very prevalent in uh, institution all, for older people uh, and um, it causes severe diarrhea. Sometimes you can't get out of the bed. You can, don't have a, can, can't have a normal life because of uh, norovirus. You've heard about it from the cruise ships, but it's not really all about cruise ships. It's more than that. Uh, so there are even uh, many, many other viruses. And of course, there's always the concern about the emerging virus. We've seen what happened, the fear with Zika virus. So we need to be prepared uh, for that. And I think the, the advantage, I think having, having cured a disease, an, a viral disease like hepatitis C is open opportunities. People talk about cure. Even the title here, I see you have the word concept to cure. I don't think 10 years ago you dare have the word cure in your, in your your titles because I think now we can do it and it's opened up the way for HIV cure. We talk about that. Uh, we talk about HPV cure uh, and we talk about other cures. So I think this is moving along. It's a train that's left the station and we can do it with the right people, the right innovation, the right uh, science and the right data that we need. But I think these are the major ones. I think influenza, respiratory virus like RSV, and norovirus, but you may have others. Um, I, again, I want to remind the audience, we'd love to hear questions, just step up to the microphone. But in the meantime, um, a question for Dr. Maniatis, uh, and I was intrigued by your, and heartened by your suggestion that it's understanding the fundamental biology is critical to therapeutic discovery. But I guess that leads to the question of whether every biomedical researcher should be thinking about translation or the translational implications, or is it okay for some investigators to study something very basic and leave the translation to someone else? Do you think it should be hardwired into every bio life science investigator to think about the treatments that may, they may generate? Absolutely not. I, uh, I think that um, individuals have very different interests, uh, abilities, uh, that lead them in one way or the other in science. And uh, we have to be in uh, environments in which we're surrounded by people who think differently and have different goals in their research. Uh, and uh, it's the community of uh, people who think either totally basic, uh, mostly translational, and the combination. And I think that the, the whole life science uh, healthcare enterprise really depends uh, on having a balanced e ecosystem from that point of view, and uh, basic science is really important. Anyone in the audience? No. Okay, go ahead. Um, thanks so much for being on the panel. Uh, this one is for Dr. Eskenazi. Specifically, uh, you mentioned um, that it would be until like maybe 2036 until HCV is like completely cured. And I was wondering how you think that timeline can be shortened by just decreasing the barriers to access and what are the right innovations for um, that specific issue? Yeah, some of the companies that are, I mean, I'm not a company person, I'm a still academic, although I'm involved with companies and I formed companies and sold them and so on. But I think some of the companies have sort of said, okay, we got a 12-week treatment, we don't need shorter treatment and we'll stop all research on HCV, for example. We're not gonna try and shorten duration of treatment for whatever reason. We're not gonna develop uh, injectables like we're now doing for H HIV. And I think this is a big mistake. And also the fact that we are not, the companies, there's not enough talk among the companies. There are great drugs 
that are no longer being developed for HCV for by uh, by J and J, for example, and uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and some other smaller company, Achilleon and others. So there are little companies too that have drugs, but they're not developing them. And I think if uh, the government or some some groups could come together and try some of these combinations and become more accessible at lower cost. Uh, that could be, uh, do trials, that could be very, and this is up to you, I think the NIH should be doing this, the government should be doing this, our government combined with European governments to do this and work together, we can come up with uh, combinations that can be a lot shorter, and if there are, if it can become, say, if, like a ZPAC, like I said, you can actually go much faster, so that's what I'm hoping. Uh, but it hasn't been done. We're working a little bit on, uh, on nanoparticles in our, at our place, but with no resources on, for this topic, although we got great people at Georgia Tech, uh, Emory, working together on this, but it's still a uh, work in progress. But I think it is possible. Imagine people just getting an inject, uh, an in, an in, a small injection once, and they slowly release the drug for 12 weeks or eight weeks or whatever. Come back and see me in 12 weeks' time, and I get your and I get your, uh, your viral load, because it's very clear the viral load is the key. Uh, certainly, you need to know about the cirrhosis, and you need to know what level they are, but still, even if you have F3, F4, which is the worst type of cirrhosis, you can still uh, uh, be cured, and the liver is a fantastic organ that regenerates itself, so you can, you will, you can go people who have severe cirrhosis that basically become normal. So, again, you know, having right in Times Square, uh, a little bus uh, giving injections of these drugs, uh, testing quickly, and anybody who's positive just give a jab like you do a vaccination. I don't think it's a big deal. I think the drugs that we have today are relatively very safe, and uh, we, can, we can come up with very innovative solutions if we wanted to, rather than depend on the big farmers. There's one other question from the audience. Hi, um, thank you for being on the panel. Um, I had more of a question about um, how would you propose to um, incentivize companies that are motivated by financial reasons to push these types of drugs, these cures onto the market when they have drugs that work that they're able to, to make money off of? And yeah. I'm not a politician and I'm not involved in drug companies as I said, I'm not just a scientist but I've helped form companies. I think uh, giving tax incentives to the companies is one way of doing it. Uh, prolonging their patent life, giving them shorter, but that would be another way of doing it, I think. Uh, there are, you know, you mortgage your house, why not mortgage, uh, have a financial way of getting these drugs at a reasonable price, pay over 10 years instead of uh, one year. So there are many ways of doing it, provide the, the price is fair to begin with and compatible. You remember, today we spend, for HIV, and personal HIV, we spend $20,000 a year forever. Here we can spend uh, forty dollars or $50,000 a year for an HCV cure, and you don't have to take, unless you get reinfected, you don't need to be treated again. You're cured for life, so that's an advantage. So I think, I think we, there's a lot more debate that needs to be take place, but the key is to identify the people who have HCV and and find a way to treat them, even the early, not just the ones who have F2, F3, F4, even when they get infected, because as, as I mentioned, there's 1.75 million new people every year who get hepatitis C, so we gotta do something about it. Thank you. So uh, let me sort of ask the panel a general question, and I'm not addressing it in terms of Dr. Skinazi or antivirals, but how can one balance the price of the medication with the costs uh, which it takes to develop such medications. Who wants to start first? So how can one balance the price of new medications? I think to start with, we need transparency from the industry. Um, you know, we can't let the pharma lobby just sit around and come up with numbers of how many billions of dollars, which can be based on how many failures a company had, which may or may not be due to um, their genius, but their lack thereof. And I don't know that we have to pay for that. Um, and I think that uh, we really have to take a very hard look at um, what was the social contract in this country uh, that differs from the rest of Western democracies and, and most developed countries that all are single, you know, largely 
single negotiators with drug companies so that those companies um, have a, fi a fixed price. There's no chance for those companies to negotiate. Well, in the U.S., you know, they've got patent life extensions. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act gave biologics 12 years of market exclusivity. Uh, drugs for orphan diseases have nine years of exclusivity. Um, the payback for that has always been a kind of implicit social contract that the drugs would be affordable. Um, but we've lost that in the last few years. And that's a tragedy. Uh, and we've lost it, I think, because lots of the people who run those companies are not the kind of people that are on this panel. Um, you know, when I was early in my career and I was helping companies develop all these Alzheimer's drugs, the, the people who I would meet were people like us, whose values were, we're gonna see how effective our treatments can be for the broadest number of people. And yeah, we're gonna make a return on investment, but we're going to uh, make it affordable as well. And no one would justify their cost of drug by saying, well, look how much money is saving the healthcare system. Imagine if they had said that about the polio vaccine. What would be charged for the polio vaccine if what we said was how much money it saved the system instead of what's a fair return on investment? And I think if we continue to go down this road, there will be people from both the right and the left of the political spectrum who will bring the hammer down on big pharma so hard that we'll lose innovation. Anyone else? He said it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So can you answer the question I was going to ask, but just reiterate, I was going to ask, what is the biggest threat to therapeutic discovery? And you, would you agree that it's this uh, dynamic with pharma and... Well, I, th I think it's, by the way, it's not just pharma. Uh, the, in my opinion, the NIH has not placed enough emphasis on therapeutic discovery. Um, and in, in the field that, that I'm in, the National Institute of Mental Health has put very little money into the discovery of, of new treatments you, you tend to have to have your results before uh, you, you can be funded. And I think that's true for many of the other institutes. And you know, the NIH you know, can be very helpful to move along our discoveries um, you know, you know, so that the collaboration with industry is, is clear, but uh, we've done our part. And it's very hard to do it when NIH uh, is unwilling to take risk in uh, therapeutic development. And as, you know, I think a lot of the great discoveries were um, NIH failed to support them. In my case, uh, NIH didn't want to support ketamine studies in the beginning. Uh, it, it, we had to do it through other means. And I think that might be true for some of the other discoveries related to uh, hepatitis C and so forth. So NIH has got to come to the table on this. Mm -hmm. Well, but, uh, however, I, I, want to, I want to tell you in the cardiovascular field has been different. Interestingly, if you go back to the history, you started with the statins. You started in Europe and then funded by the NIH and three different trials. The SK9 inhibitors for familial hypercholesterolemia, the new anticoagulants, oral anticoagulants, factor 10A, and antithrombins were all funded uh, by NIH. And, and now, very recently, the glucose sodium uh, non-absorbent approach for the diabetes, uh, two trials funded by NIH. So I think what you're saying is correct, but I must say in the cardiovascular field, it's hard for me to say NIH has not been supportive. But I'm gonna also, I would support what Dr. Dean Charney said, and it could be the area of expertise um, that, or in the, the institute at NIH. But when we say NIH, it's often us scientists because it's study section, and one of the things to me what is the death of innovation is dogma. And you'll get back that people believe that they know how this particular mechanism works, or they tried this in their own lab and it didn't work, so therefore they're not supportive of quote unquote anything novel. So I think scientists right now, we are one of the problems in innovation. I, I, and so for the young people, as I said, you know, for me, we have to get away from dogma and believing every single thing that you find must be so, because that's what's the beauty of research and that's the beauty of discovery, is that we don't know. And it is, I, I, again, I think um, um, Dr. Charney had mentioned in terms of just, you know, it's being 
open to seeing new things. And NIH just listens to the study section, and they don't dare to set up new systems to really propagate and, and, and um, support novel therapeutic tra translation. You know, another reason that why that's important, and we'll, I'm just speaking from the point of neuroscience, it's hard to discover new treatments for brain diseases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies have pulled out because they've had failure in Alzheimer's disease, in, um, in, neuropsych in psychiatric disease. And so if they pull out, then what are we to do in, term in terms of discovering new treatments? That's why I think NIH has to uh, come forward. Yeah. I agree, actually, in the, in the cardiovascular field, if you look at, you are targeting molecules that are very well recognized. You're targeting cholesterol, and then you're targeting uh, the platelet as a cell. You're targ targeting the clotting system, very well understood. So I think the funding really has been very much into areas that uh, you have a particular molecule or cell that, you can really, that has been identified as, a being a, as being a significant risk for cardiovascular disease, and then the funding comes through. Yeah. Part of what ja Yasmin says, which is so true, is kind of the circularity and the self-servingness of study sections. Yeah. We've all been on study sections, and we know that the really innovative stuff, which may be uh, break the mold, isn't something that the true believers who sit on study sections and have been doing something the same way for a long time will want to believe. That's certainly part of the reason why the last 35 drugs have failed in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, yeah. these guys have all thought that it's a mutation in the amyloid gene, and it's only recently they began to realize, oh, it could be the microglia. Oh, how about that? <laughs> you couldn't get that funded. And I mean, for brain disorders, back to Dr. Maniati's um, point and uh, Dr. Fuster, we don't know the underlying neurobiology of most of the uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. And that has been the challenge. While in cardiology, there is fundamental knowledge of that. And I think that that's why it's been more challenging. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I heard a statement by uh, Wally Gilbert uh, a couple of years ago at a historic meeting at Cold Spring Harbor. And uh, they were talking about uh, inventing uh, DNA sequencing methods and Sanger and um, Maxim and Gilbert. And uh, he made the point that back then uh, there was uh, much less of an emphasis on a very specific application or a very specific uh, objective of the, of, of the grant that we now see that has, uh, is worked over by study sections very deeply. And he made the point that he would not have discovered the method for DNA sequencing if that had been his objective. It came out of uh, other research and other pieces came together, and it was a, uh, an amazing, obviously, and um, important advance. And it wasn't based on uh, uh, following uh, a protocol for a grant. We have a question from the audience. Hi, um, I have a question um, to Dr. Sneoji. So uh, in the current ACV research, there's a problem of preclinical drug development is the great, I mean, it's not a good animal model. So, um, so how can I overcome this problem? This is the first question. And second question is, um, there is lots of chimeric ACV virus nowadays in the world. Yeah. Um, so is your drug is working on those also? Yeah, so my advice to you is to change animal model to another virus, <laughs> because I think uh, developing HCV, there, are, there were models, they were not terribly, they were useful to some extent, but not, not very useful. I think certainly models for HBV would be better. Uh, so that's something I would immediately uh, think about uh, doing. Um, the chimeric virus, I don't know enough. About what, what are you, I didn't know what your, lead, your question is leading to exactly. So um, I found some papers like um, in HCV there is type 1A or 1B, there is there just fusions in some parts of the 1A or some parts of the yeah. 2B like that. Uh, it's reported in Russia, reported in yeah. Egypt, report also in the US in some parts. Subtypes, yeah, there are, I mean, there are subtypes. They're still discovering subtypes, and the co always concern is that are the drugs gonna work against these? I mean, they found one, I think, in the Philippines recently um, that was weird. 
uh, but I don't know much about it. We started thinking about that as well, but we haven't done anything. I think, as I mentioned in my talk, the, the areas of research for HCV are really vaccine. We should really develop a vaccine for HCV. People are doing it. We'll get some data very soon from Johns Hopkins. Hopefully very soon we'll hear whether the vaccine works or doesn't work. Uh, Andrea Cox is one of the leading scientists in this area and we will hear whether her vaccine that she's developed uh, works or doesn't work, I mean, maybe the last shot. Uh, it would be great to cure people and treat them afterwards, vaccinate them. Uh, so that would be the way to do it. It's a bit like uh, putting the cork on a bottle and then sealing the cork, uh, make sure it doesn't, the person doesn't get infected again. So, and also the short, short treatment, but 3D animal models, uh, I think, you, you will have it. You'll, you, it's all, always interesting, but it will be uh, difficult to get funding. Let's put it this way. Oh, thank you. So I'm not picking on you, Yasmin, <laughs> but I have another question for you. <laughs> what are the unique challenges for women in science from your own personal experience? I don't think we have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll focus it on innovation, and I do think just like many other things for women in science, to be an innovator as a woman, for innovation in general, you need a lot of support, and so that, as we just said, NIH is not really the place, and it's usually trying to get resources from um, venture capitalists, um, from your own institution, and, and, and the likes. And often, when you look at the numbers, um, very few women get those kinds of, of resources just to go after an idea. They have to, the question usually is, um, so who's helping you? Usually it's like, is there this guy with a particular thing in there with you? And it's, it's very challenging to really get, um, to be able to fail. So I think if a woman, would say, would, a number of people talked about failure um, as being an important part of of discovery and moving on. But often if you fail once as a woman, you don't get a chance to, move, to get to, do, to fail multiple times. So I, I still think that in our science world, as in our discovery and innovation, women are put at a higher, we have to have a higher bar to climb to be um, supported on multiple levels. And that's one thing I think that, you know, um, we definitely have to work on. There was a study that I'm trying to, um, when you look at the number of women in an, these innovation um, networks and in some of the, um, even in Boston and some of the areas that have these uh, companies that are innovative companies, there, I think it was like not even 10% of women were in them. That says a lot. Yeah. Maybe I can ask Dr. Fuster a question, uh, which I know is near and dear to his heart. Um, we, we clearly have great success stories with medications in heart disease, and it's not unusual that you hear half-jokingly, well, I don't have to worry about eating that steak, I'll just take an extra statin. So I guess my question is, is, there, is, there, is the availability of medicines uh, diverting us from issues around lifestyle and environment? Well, it's an interesting question, and this brings a point that I think is very important in cardiovascular disease, and that is what age of the patient you're talking about. If you're talking about patients over age of 70, the data is overwhelming. Only 25% of patients who have a myocardial infarction are taking the drugs that they are supposed to take. Mm -hmm. So the adherence is terrible. And this is why when we talk about personalized medicine, you laugh a little bit from the cardiovascular side because the great problem is people are not taking just the medicine they are supposed to take. So that's number one. What is the opposite is younger people. And younger people that are obese, a little bit of high cholesterol, they say, you know what, let me take a statin, my cholesterol will go down. And this is very prevalent in young people taking medication just rather than changing behavior. So I think it's quite fascinating, the difference in age. But I will tell you something that applies to both groups that is very troublesome to us, is the vitamins. I have to tell you, of the patients who come to see us with cardiovascular disease, whether they are young or older, the most predominant medication is actually vitamins and supplements. And in our field, all the trials done with vitamins and supplements have failed, and even 
the results can be detrimental. So we are in a world that is very, very, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And the question is, how do you deal with it? And I will say to you, in the elderly people, where the incidence of myocardial infarction is so high, we have developed, we have the first polypill in the world, which has been approved in the last year in 58 countries. It contains an aspirin, an ACE inhibitor, and then uh, the uh, statin. And basically, what this drug does improves tremendously the adherence. If you take one drug a day, then three or four, and we have proved this in two trials. And now we are, this is under the FDA too, for approval. Yes, we have a question over there. Yes, hello. Um, I had a general question for the panel. Um, with all this discussion around funding, I'm wondering if anyone could suggest some approaches of perhaps with public-private partnerships to help make the discovery more sustainable um, and perhaps more productive too. We know well. There are some examples that you know that we haven't in the cancer field. Uh, so it requires trust, you know, and collaboration on on both sides. So uh, the, the example I have here, uh, which was promoted by Eric Liam and uh, Steve Borkop, that has involved the cancer centers at Mount Sinai and Columbia and um, and Hopkins and and Penn, where uh, Celgene, you know, has committed a lot of funds to work with the four cancer centers to develop new treatments for the most serious forms of cancer. And they, they uh, came up with a, 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 an approach where the intellectual property is shared between the company and each of the, the four uh, cancer centers. So you need to work on developing incentives on both sides, on the academic side and the industry side, and you can make it work. Yeah, there's another beautiful example, I think, of partnership, and that is the one with cystic fibrosis between Vertex and the Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation. Are you aware with that one? Because it's really amazing that the, I think the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation invests something like $300 million, something like that, in Vertex to develop a drug for cystic fibrosis, which turned out to be successful. And of course, the benefit was probably a 10x or 15x for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, so that's, again, they can reinvest that money for additional drugs for cystic fibrosis, and of course, Vertex did very well as well, because they found relatively cheap money, uh, and uh, with a lot of risk uh, for, for, for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, but certainly they were, obviously had people, smart people, on the panel who board directors, Now I don't think uh, I wanna give any more money to cystic fibrosis, because they've got three point billion dollars in the reserve, but uh, it's amazing what mountain of cash you can create if there's these partnership work between nonprofits and for-profit institutions. So I always, uh, I go to meetings and I see the commissioner of this and the commissioner of that, and they talk about academic relationships. They hardly ever mention drug companies. I think it's very important to bring the drug companies uh, to talk to government. It's no, I mean, of course we can't, they, nobody's asking them to give them a gift or anything like that, you know, $12 gift or $15 gift or whatever they, the, the limit is today, but, Talk to, and buying lunches or talking to each other is so important, and they're not doing this as much as I would like. They're so worried about conflict of interest that it sort of stifles the relationship between government, institution like NIH and so on, and FDA with the drug companies. Question here. Hi, uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, Dr. Davis mentioned uh, transparency earlier, and I think a uh, current problem with a number of clinical trials is the failure to report results. Uh, do you agree that this is a problem and what are some steps towards solving this? Yeah, it is a problem, yeah, because many times, and generally it's the negative results that are not reported, and, and that results in uh, uh, other studies being done when you, if you knew the answer, they would not, um, you would not have done the study. Now there is, you know, initiatives with clinicaltrial.gov where there are essentially new rules where you have to report the results of the trials that have been registered. So that, uh, I think, is improving, uh, but it it's, can still be a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's also a problem, it's less of a problem with industry-sponsored studies 
where the results have to be reported. It still is a problem with smaller studies that are negative done by academic centers, um, in part because you know, many journals won't accept negative trials. So they never get accepted and never, they never get reported. Uh, you know, Valentin may want to comment on that. He, you know, he's the editor of the major cardiovascular uh, journal, but uh, journal editors are trying to change that so that important negative trials are being uh, published. Yeah, the negative trials that are being published are those in which everybody thought the drug was working, <laughs> and it doesn't. This paper, if it is a good trial, really gets in very easily into good journals. But there are many trials that are negative on things that even on the hypothesis basis should fail, and then the journals feel very low. I don't think it's because the journals uh, we take, uh, the fact that it's negative is a no, actually it's not correct. We discuss lots of negative trials, but I think I'm giving you the pattern of how, how the decisions are being made. I think our, the decisions are, are, are actually uh, rather appropriate. And there's some um, move now to have, uh, in line with clinicaltrials.gov, um, forcing more um, transparency for those that failed, and even those that um, um, had positive results, timing of how that they should be um, um, reported faster. But there are now going to be um, online database systems where you can have um, all data um, submitted as well. So I think that that will help ultimately in transparency. So uh, time is short, but I want to ask one, one maybe appropriate last question to anyone who wants to tackle it, and that is what's the uh, best way to engage the next generation? How do we get young people excited in what we do and where we want to see our fields go? Let me start. Um, I think it starts at a very young age. I think that um, you know education of our children uh, has to make science exciting. And um, that means uh, teachers, we have to train um, to be able to teach science at a very young age. Um, the experience that I had with my children uh, as they were growing up, and my wife and I, both scientists, would talk to their teachers about what are we doing in science, what we'd find is they didn't feel competent to even do simple experiments to get kids excited. I mean, when I was growing up, we'd watch Mr. Wizard and be very excited about the science that was possible. Um, and then it extends into high school, um, where there are still, to get back to Yasmin's point, the question you asked, inherent impl implicit biases about women in science and math. And that has to stop too. So I think this has to be at a very early age that we make science very, very important uh, in our schools and we train our teachers so that they feel competent in teaching science. Uh, I would add mentorship. Yep. So I, I, uh, it's important for those you know, who are further along in their career to provide great mentorship that is altruistic and uh, sharing so that as somebody is earlier in their career, they see that they're going to get credit uh, for their creativity and their innovation and that uh, you know, that credit is not going to be taken by a more senior mentor. Uh, I was lucky in my career. I had a very generous, you know, mentor who, uh, you know, allowed me to go uh, to areas that were maybe weren't so clear, and he gave me uh, he, all the credit, and that really motivated me. And I'm still very thankful to uh, how he helped my career. Couldn't agree more, uh, Dr. Maniatis, and then Dr. Fuster. Yeah, I, um, I think the most important thing is to get politics out of science. Uh, I, I have recall two recent conversations that are relevant to this. One is uh, there was a, a person at one of the uh, foundations uh, that, the Tao, uh, that the Tao Foundation supports, which is uh, on uh, public science. And the story was about uh, a, a person who went to, that was re reporting this story, went to uh, an island in the South Pacific uh, that is very, uh, has no altitude at all, so it becomes flooded if there are uh, rises in the water in the ocean. And they took a, a young uh, child and uh, talked about how they were learning science and so on. And, and of course there they believe in global warming. I mean, they think that they see it in action. 
And so uh, this uh, family of this child had to move uh, to Oklahoma. And they ended up there and they, real and they saw that they don't teach global warming in Oklahoma in high school. It's not allowed to be taught. Uh, similarly, uh, I, re I recently heard a, a person who writes bio biological mm -hmm. text textbooks for high school and the number of states in which his book is banned because it has a chapter on evolution. And uh, he, he was saying that there was a, a county in, uh, in West Virginia that uh, banned his textbook. And actually, the, the, the school board glued all the pages together in the evolution part and allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. So, so I, th I, I really think that you know, if, if, we're, if we're trying to get young people excited and interested in science, they have to learn science. They, they can't be affected by politics, and I think that's a major problem in our country right now. Absolutely. Dr. Fuster, final word? Yeah, i, I just like to emphasize the word motivation here, and uh, uh, Dr. Charney mentioned the mentors have to be motivating. The institutions have to be motivating, and I have to say, and I don't have any problem in saying it, it's fantastic to be part of Mount Sinai uh, as a person who has been here many years, and I have to say to you, the motivating uh, environment for us to do research is incredible. And I think I just wanted to point this out. But this is a final comment I want to make. We have done an experiment in Spain, which is the country where I come from. And basically, we go to the school system in the country and we pick up the uh, 15 and 16 year olds that are more curious and that we are told that we are creative and we give uh, 10, 15 grants every year to visit a laboratory. We ended up having now 100 scientists in the National Center of Cardiovascular Investigation in Madrid. They were just chosen at that age. And the point I'm trying to make is, the great tragedy is we are not capable to motivate people. And the people are there. We, do, we should not motivate everybody. They will come out once they see that there is something worth it. And I just say this experiment, I think you mentioned this, the importance of really getting at a very young age. To me, that's where, the, the, this is where really we should put our attention, or, or our measured attention. That's an appropriate place to close. I want to thank uh, my co-chair, Peter Palese, and the outstanding esteemed panelists. Thank you all.